Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bonatti alongside Ethan Euchre. We have a lot to cover. Let's get started. Chronic pain affects nearly 50 million Americans, with new cases occurring even more frequently than cases of diabetes, hypertension, and depression. A new book hopes to empower people with the information they need to finally take control of their pain and their lives. Joining us to discuss is Afton L. Hassett, author of Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills to Help You Thrive. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here today. Certainly. So really, how big a problem is chronic pain? You know, it really is one of our most major and impactful chronic diseases and conditions. We um, are amazed at how many new cases are on, always being diagnosed. And yet we have such limited um, effective treatments for people with chronic pain. What different types of chronic pain are there? I mean, that's just a broad umbrella term. You know, what are the most common? What different types are there? That's a great question. So there are many types of pain and they require different types of interventions. A really common type of pain is due to inflammation. And that's something like we might see with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, There's another type of pain that we're also very familiar with, like from arthritis, like osteoarthritis, where bone is grinding on bone. That's also incredibly painful. And then there's neuropathic pain. Some people have this where a nerve is pinched and there's a lot of tingling or pain down the leg. And then a really common type of pain that we know less about, but that our group spends a lot of time studying is a type of pain that's actually driven or made worse by the brain. And we call that nociplastic pain. And this is a type of pain that we see commonly in conditions like chronic low back pain or fibromyalgia, but it also can overlap in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis and everywhere. And really the distinguishing characteristic is that the brain plays plays just an outsized role in the actual experience of pain, of nosoplastic pain. We talked to um, a ton of people that have undergone surgeries where there were actual physical conditions that were lending to symptomatology of a fibromyalgia or these um, types of diseases that doctors were saying were just in the brain, but there was actually a physical reason that they were experiencing that. What happens at that point? Because a lot of these people were starting to think, gosh, I have a mental issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all in the brain. How, how do you yeah. work with that or, or take that into consideration? Yeah. Well, we do want to tease it out. So when we think of a mental issue, that kind of implies it's psychiatric and perhaps it's just a manifestation of depression or anxiety, which is no further th- from the truth than, than I can imagine. Sure. Um, really, when it is predominantly in the brain, as we see is in fibromyalgia, mm-hmm. that truly is the brain structure and function has changed. The networks of the brain are different. They look different than they do in people without chronic pain. There really is a true biological process underlying it. Now, that's not to say that there cannot be a pain generator someplace in the body. Right. So frequently, people will have a really bad knee that they get replaced. They have a, you know undergo surgery and get a new knee. And then they continue to have chronic pain. And they can't believe it. All their neighbors you know, got better after having arthroplasty, yet they still have chronic pain. What we've learned is in many cases where there is something in the body that's causing the pain, even when that's replaced, some of that brain-mediated pain still exists, and that requires you know, a, a different type of treatment. So the knee, yes, it might, probably had to be replaced, but there still is the pathways, the, the memory of the pain and the pain um, amplification that's going on, and that is still going to need to be treated. And so how are your solutions, uh, I guess, different from traditional uh, treatments for chronic pain? Yes. So it, it, I know that it's necessarily different, but I think it's a wonderful add-on. And so I think most of the time we think when we have a chronic illness, um, we go to the doctor and ideally they give us a solution and we get a pill or we have an intervention and whatever we have gets better. But what we see in many chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, chronic pain is that the patient has to do a lot too for good health, that there is a lot of monitoring, there's a lot of perhaps diet and exercise changes, things that we actually are empowered to do ourselves to make our health better. And this is so true in chronic pain. So working with a physician, working with a physical therapist, and then even doing your own self-management is critical. And that's what the book is about. It gives you kind of that third piece, the piece that you can do. And I try to make it um, enjoyable because we really do like to do the things that um, feel interesting and engaging. And they're the type of things we'll continue to do. And so that is the goal of the book 
explain some of this neuroscience, how it is that the brain mediates pain, and then how simple things we can do actually begin to help rewire how pain, how the pain signal is being processed. And what are some of those things people could be doing? Yeah. So it's the things your grandma probably told you to do for good health. So stay hydrated, get some sleep, get a little bit of exercise, eat well, but also stress. Stress is one of our major, major killers. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't have to be because there's much that we can do to decrease our stress levels. And there are years of data that show that stress makes pain worse. So many of the um, activities we have are helping to fight stress. So there are some breathing activities. There are some minor exercise activities. So just going for a walk in nature is incredibly resettling to your stress response system. Just sitting amongst green things, even on your patio, is incredibly restorative. But also doing things that increase positive emotions, like doing the things you love, finding ways to get back to the hobbies that you enjoy, spending the time with the people that you love, and then even doing little private practices like keeping a gratitude journal or doing acts of kindness, doing acts of kindness for yourself and having self-compassion. All of these things contribute to knocking down the sense of stress, increasing positive emotions, and even getting you moving. And these are all things that help us cope better with chronic pain. Sounds like um, really honing in on time management skills can help with that because we all know um, the hustle and bustle of every day. And especially if you have a loved one, children, those things tend to eat at time. And not that that's a bad thing, but it's just trying to find maybe your own time to, like you said, decompress um, kind of take in the day and and think about those things. And I, I think yeah. we forget about that. Oh, no, that's such a good point that um, a, a lot of us do this, but we really see this in chronic pain, that they put everybody kind of before themselves. Mm. And then all the things that they must do have to get done because there's only so much energy yes. that people have when they're dealing with a chronic condition. And so you get the work done, you get the um, take care of the kids, you take care of work, you take care of the house things, you run errands, pay bills. And there's no time left for yourself. But what we say, and one of the skills that we try to teach is really the value of scheduling time for yourself and really putting it on your calendar and treating it like a doctor's appointment, doing this thing for yourself. And it it can be as simple as having a cup of coffee with a friend, of engaging in a hobby you really enjoy, um, spending some time with your pets or children. All of these things we really need to make a part of our lives and and invite it back in. Because again, chronic pain is a marathon, right? We need to be able to prepare ourselves to handle this for a long time and to decrease the pain over time and rather than try to do everything all at once. I I had a weird experience with fibromyalgia myself around the time that my daughter was born and the pain was so real, um, excruciating. It almost felt like your hand was amputated when you went to lift anything, something as light as a sheet or, or just brushing the teeth. And I would go to doctors and they would do all their testings. And then mm-hmm. they put me on something, I think it was called Pamelor. I found out that it was something with the spine, but no doctor w- at that time was really looking at what was the cause. They just threw a label fibromyalgia yeah. and it really does make you think it's in your mind. So I'm glad that you came up with this chronic pain reset to try to help people. And then also they really have to be diligent and looking at the true root cause, because if you do need intervention, mm-hmm. then you need to seek it. Oh, I th- thank you for sharing your story. That, that's really brave of you. And I think it's really helpful for others to hear that people do get solutions. Mm-hmm. And I do encourage you know people to continue to seek solutions because yes. sometimes it's, it's, it requires one more physician to take a look at, or yes. sometimes it requires one more bit of insight that you have because nobody knows your body better than you. But the, the um, things that we teach in Chronic Pain Reset are good for just about any type of pain, for helping people you know, kind of write their lives to some degree, because chronic pain can steal so much. It, it certainly can. And giving people the tools to deal with it helps immensely and lets them know it's not just in their brain. Thank you so yeah. much for being on the program. Afton L. Hassett, author of Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills to help you thrive. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that wraps up this segment. Make sure you stay tuned. We'll have more after the break. 
Don't be screwed by lesser spine institutes who bait you with minimally invasive procedures, then switch to screws, rods, disc replacements, and hardware. At Bonatti, no metal hardware fusions are ever used. Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti spine procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Pam is an active woman in Tampa, Florida, who enjoys day traveling and walking with her husband. I'm a homemaker, and for uh, it's what I do, we're retired. And for fun, uh, we like just, we'll go out to eat, we'll go say, take a day trip. Pam's pain started years ago and has only worsened over time. The pain started, you know, many years ago, and I had... Uh, scoliosis and it gets gradually got worse and over time and in the past two to three years it got really bad and I started having more aches and pains in other areas of my body. When I had the pain it was on usually always my right side. I would say more my hip area and that's where I'd have to stretch because the muscles would spasm and from spasming you know you, you your body tightens up and you can't walk. We would try to walk and I would say we've got to stop and I'd have to do some stretches uh, because of the pain mainly my right side and in doing those stretches it helped but just a few minutes and then I'd, I said we've got to walk back home finally he would say something about going for a walk and I'd just end up saying you go and I'll stay home I end up doing a lot of I, a lot of sitting got to where it just I think it made it worse because I wasn't moving around it's such a job just to get to walk from one room to another. It's exhausting, it was exhausting. I was struggling to walk in. I got to the point I was needing a wheelchair. If I was gonna walk a long distance, I didn't wanna be dependent. And I was just, in the past few months, had started using a wheelchair on some cases, like going to the airport. So I really was getting where I could not do anything. Pam used over-the-counter medication to try and relieve her pain, but soon realized she was going to require something more to help her regain her ability to walk. The Tylenol thing, like most people, some kind of a painkiller. I was so tired of calling doctors and going to doctors and getting, you know, this medication or that medication. Toward the end, I did do some physical therapy. It was uh, due to... Uh, a pain that I was having in my foot is the reason I got started there. Whatever I tried, nothing helped. Pam's husband saw a commercial for the Bonatti Spine Institute while watching TV and suggested that it was something they should look into. He saw uh, one of the commercials. And so then we got online and we started doing our own research from there. I really appreciate all of these videos that uh, you do because it explains things, and I've, ex I've told friends about uh, Dr. Bonatti and his procedure and what others had said. After a preliminary physical exam, Pam was sent to the on-campus imaging center for a series of x-rays. A short while later, she met with the surgeon to review her MRIs and fresh x-rays to determine a customized surgical plan to eliminate her pain. I was excited about coming to, for consultation to hear more about what my back looks like, how, what they see in my spine. When I came here, I did have an x-ray taken here at the Bonatti Institute. And uh, the gentleman who helped me with that, the process, very polite. And I will say that about everybody here. It's very polite. And then Dr. Bonatti came in and I said, oh, I am so glad to see you. And he said the same thing back to me and then he pat me on the arm and I thought, oh, that's, that's neat. But because he really has spoken to me through the videos and then to meet him in person touched me. The exclusive Bonatti spine procedures are performed incrementally using conscious IV sedation, where the patient remains awake and communicating with their surgeon to determine the source of their pain and eliminate it before they leave the operating table. I liked having, um, not being put out for surgery. I like being able to be aware. They do ask questions. 
you know, did we take care of everything? Are you feel how are you feeling? I really like the idea of being able to communicate with my doctor. So I was able to have my husband in the surgery with me. My husband loved it. He thought it was interesting. There was a monitor. He could watch the monitor and he could see the exact same thing Dr. Bonatti was doing. When I had my last procedure, they said that this would help going go down my leg and where I had pain as well. And I tell you, last night I realized I don't have that pain anymore. It was gone. The pain is gone in my right foot. No pain there? No pain there. No pain here? No pain. No pain on the butt? No. No pain on the back? No. After surgery at the Bonatti Spine Institute, patients are asked to take a brief walk in the recovery room before returning home or to a nearby hotel to continue their walking regimen. The nurse, yeah, she was right there with me as we walked up and down the recovery room. I haven't been in the hospital. You know, it's all done here at the Institute. And, and it was nice being able to say that. Stayed in a motel that's only five minutes away and that really, that, that helped tremendously. I have no brace at all. What they asked me to do after surgery is walk, get up and walk every day. That's a gift of life, really. My original pain, yeah, of why I came here, that's gone, yeah. What I'm feeling is the effects of surgery. And I'm, I'm very thankful that I came here. I really am. I would most definitely recommend Manati Spine Institute to everyone. And I have people watching me now uh, because I've come and every day I get home, they said, how did things go for you today? They want to know. And some of them have had back surgeries. They're watching me and I, they're coming to me every time I see them. And I'm talking right now mainly uh, people at church. Now pain-free, Pam is looking forward to spending quality time with her husband again. To go shopping together. We enjoy uh, Costco's are one of our favorite places, so we'll go there together and walk up and down those aisles. Welcome to American Medicine Today. So for millions of Americans, Tucker Carlson was one of the only voices on cable news that provided a counter-narrative to the mainstream press. When he was abruptly fired by Fox News, the outpouring of anger from his fans truly showed just how popular the man is. A new book offers an inside look into one of the most beloved and polarizing media figures of our time. Please welcome Chadwick Moore to the show, author of Tucker, the Biography. Thank you for joining us, Chadwick. Hey, thank you for having me on. It's great to be with you. Certainly. So you were given kind of unprecedented access to Tucker for this book. Why don't you tell us about that experience? Sure. I, I was um, so I was a regular guest on Tucker's show for basically the whole run of the show. And weirdly enough, I was a guest on the final episode on April 21st, which, of course, we didn't know would be the final episode. Right. So that's just sort of how I was familiar with Tucker in his orbit. Mm -hmm. um, but we started working on this book um, early last spring 2022. So well before um, the, the drama, before the show was taken off. And during that time, I, I got to spend tons of time with Tucker, uh, stay in his home, get to know him, his family. And really, you know, learn about his life, his history, where he comes from, uh, what motivates him and what's he, what's he like as a human being and how he became what he is today. Uh, and I think that that, um, you know, that was something uh, I think I don't think there's a lot of, you know, cable news personalities that you want to read a biography about. Certainly there's not many I'd want to write one about, but I always knew Tucker was was different. I knew there's a lot more to him than, than met the eye. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the man like when the camera isn't rolling? I mean, I've, I've worked with so many media people throughout the years and they're charming and all of this on air and then off air, they're just, you know, this rotten person. Um, so what was Tucker actually like the man? I, I would completely agree with that characterization, by the way, with a lot of people I've met mm -hmm. in TV and, um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Tucker was not like that at all. I mean, he's he's extremely um, down to earth, personable, very hilarious, uh, extremely welcoming, uh, warm, sensitive. Uh, you know, he's very, very literary. And I think probably the biggest takeaway is, um, you know, he's not someone who 
just cares about politics per se. He's someone that can really talk about anything and he's interested in anything. And he cares much more about the bigger issues such as, you know, morality, family, spirituality. Uh, and he sees those things as, as, uh, as, as politics is downhill from those things. But, uh, you know, when you get to talking to him, it's not just like, you know, Trump versus DeSantis. It's more about these bigger questions. Right. Uh, and uh, I think that really informs his appeal and, and, uh, you know, his his thinking about political issues uh, and about, you know, bigger questions about life and why we're here and what does it mean to be a person? You you mentioned that his upbringing really had an effect on who he became. Can you elaborate a little more? Give us that insight. Oh, sure. His uh, his father, Dick, who I got to know, is um, a really great guy. Uh, he was also a journalist. And, you know, the reason why Tucker became a journalist was because his father was one. Mm-hmm. And Dick was... Um, is, uh, you know, they're very, very similar. Uh, Tucker still describes him as, as his greatest mentor. They talk every day, wanting to expose corruption and hypocrisy, uh, you know, wanting to, you know, make, make you know, uh, get information out there. Uh, you know, one thing about Tucker's childhood that, uh, that a lot of people don't realize is um, his, his mother, uh, her name was Lisa, she abandoned her family when Tucker was six years old. So it was really just uh, Dick and Tucker and his brother Buckley for, you know, their whole lives and childhood. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Dick had a very uh, unique style of parenting. Uh, he just kind of let the kids do whatever. And I have some funny stories in the book about that growing up, you know, Tucker, you know, driving a car when he's 13 and, you know, his dad not really caring, things like that. Been there. Uh, and I think that. <laughs> well, l- let me back up real quick, because you, you already mentioned that you were there on his final show, which he didn't know was his mm-hmm. final show. Um, as someone who has been around uh, other shows that are just unceremoniously let go. Um, were you there when the word was given or that happened after the fact? Um, my, but my real question is what, what was his reaction? Cause if you don't see it coming, it's a total blindside or did he sort of have an inkling that it might be in the works? So he didn't see it coming at all. Uh, and nobody did. Uh, and that day, uh, happened to be the six year anniversary to the day of Tucker's show moving into the 8 PM time slot. So when Fox news president, Suzanne Scott called him at about 11 o'clock that morning, she thought she was calling to congratulate him on this anniversary uh, and said she was saying, we're taking your show off the air. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Uh, they still haven't given him an explanation uh, or a reason why, much like they haven't told anyone publicly. Um, but with that said, you know, Tucker was well prepared for this moment. He'd been let go from the other two major networks, MSNBC and CNN. But aside from that, you know, he had a lot of mentors in his life that 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 basically told him, you know, one of them being... Um, uh, Larry King, another being um, uh, Roger Ailes, uh, Bill O'Reilly, who had told him, and, and even his own father, who had told him basically, you know, every job in, in television is a temporary job. You're totally replaceable. Don't get a big head about this. Don't think you're God just because you're on TV and and you have all this power. Mm-hmm. And he really carries that with him and has carried that with him his whole life. Uh, I saw that personally being around him. I, I saw the lengths he goes to to humble himself. And, uh, you know, certain rituals even has to remind himself that he's not God. I think that a lot of people working in cable TV um, didn't get that memo and (laughs) and don't understand that they're just as replaceable as Tucker. Uh, Well, Tucker's not replaceable, but the network will see you as replaceable. Um, And if they'll do it to their number one star, uh, they'll do it to anyone. Now, Tucker has been doing this live streaming on, uh, you know, X, formerly known as Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think Elon Musk said something to the effect of Tucker's uh, live streams have brought in more viewers than the population of the United States. Uh, can you speak on that? Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, according to the numbers, and that's just um, per video. Uh, his interview with Javier Malay, the the guy who's running for president of Argentina, got at last I checked 420 million views, which is more than the population of the United States. He's had some other ones that have gone higher than 330 million. Fox hasn't really recovered their viewers from Tucker. They, they bounced back slightly when they reshuffled their primetime lineup, but yeah. there's certainly millions of people who were there for Tucker, or at least were holding on to the network because they allowed Tucker to speak who haven't come back. You know, when you make a sloppy decision like they did to let him go when he was speaking the truth, mm-hmm. I guess uh, dwindling ratings is, is what they deserve. Should be expected. Yeah. So what do you see with him moving forth? Is he just going to continue on X? Is he going to formulate his own station? What do you think's in the works? So he's still under contract with Fox. And he has said to them, you know, keep your money and just let me be free. And they won't do that. 
Uh, so they're paying, they're still paying him a salary, his usual salary every week to not have a show, uh, <laughs> thinking they have the ability to keep him silent. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, the reason why he's on X is that Fox had failed to include Twitter X in their non-compete, which is why he's <laughs> able to be there. That's great. <laughs> but I know that they're, uh, you know, this has been reported before that that uh, they're raising money for their own media company. Mm -hmm. um, the last time Tucker was fired from a cable news channel was CNN. And during that time, he started The Daily Caller with his college roommate and best friend, Neil Patel. Yeah. Uh, so now I, I believe Neil and him are raising money for another venture, uh, but it's it's up in the air about how they're gonna be able to launch that while he's still mm. under contract. His contract expires one month after the next presidential election, mm. conveniently, December, 2024. Yeah. Um, but when they're able to get that off the ground, uh, Tucker's executive producer tells me that people can expect to see a lot more Tucker than they ever did on Fox. Uh, so that will be, you know, good news for their for his audience. Well, great news for X too. I'm sure they'll rake in the millions <laughs> um, as far as viewership goes. Well, thank you so much, Chadwick Moore, for being on the program. Thanks, Chadwick. Of course, thank you so much. And we want to read the biography. It sounds fascinating. Absolutely, pick up Tucker. Thanks, Chadwick. Awesome. Thank you. Take right. great care. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. Make sure you join us again next week. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the numbers below. Or you can tweet at Dr. Benatti using the hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you. 